Hi, everyone, and Happy New Year. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. My name is Andy Pushlik. I'm the leader of the Toronto Labour and Employment Group. And today I am joined by my colleagues, Matthew Curtis, who's a partner with us in Toronto, Eleni Caceres, who is a partner in our Vancouver office, and Larissa Workowicz, who is an associate in the Toronto office. So we are finally into 2022, and in fact, we're almost done the first month. What, what a month it's been uh, with the rise of Omicron, more lockdown measures, and a shift to virtual school. It has definitely been a challenging start for many of us uh, for 2022. What we're going to be focusing on is issues that we think are going to matter most to Canadian employers. Uh, Matt Curtis is going to start us off by talking about the Ontario law that came into force just at the end of 2021, that's the ban on non-competes and the introduction of a disconnecting from work policy. We'll then shift gears to Vancouver and British Columbia, where Eleni Caceres will talk about the ins and outs of BC's new paid sick leave program. Larissa Workowicz is then going to follow Eleni and discuss the new paid sick leave legislation for Canada's federally regulated employers. I am then going to finish off the webinar with a look at the four trends that we think that you should watch out for that aren't necessarily related to legislation and, and are just things that we've noticed an uptick on or things that we're actually keeping an eye on as interesting developments. So without further ado, we have a lot to cover. We're very grateful that we have so many people who have signed on. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Matt, who's going to bring you through the newest uh, ban on non-competes in Ontario, as well as that uh, disconnecting from work policy. So Matt, over to you. Thank you, Andy. It's been a very uh, busy year in 2021 with all the COVID workplace restrictions. And to uh, add uh, new issues, uh, the Ontario government has recently passed new legislation uh, unique to Canada, in fact, with respect to a uh, ban on post-employment non-competition agreements, as well as a, a disconnect from work policy requirement. So uh, at the end of last year, November, the, the government passed uh, the Working for Workers Act. Uh, there was not much advance notice that this legislation was going to be introduced in the Ontario legislature before it was in the fall of 2021, uh, but it did pass and it does have some very significant ramifications for employers in Ontario. The first one being the, uh, the ban or a limited ban under the Ontario Employment Standards Act with respect to post-employment non-competition agreements. This, in effect, bans using uh, a non-compete agreement with one's employees if that non-compete agreement uh, Im imposes post-employment uh, restrictions on the ability of the worker to, to work elsewhere. It only applies for post-employment uh, restrictions, so it's not while the employee is working for the employer. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's very uh, overreaching in, in my view and very extensive with respect to um, who, who it applies to and also what, uh, what is not allowed. One thing though to mention is that the Ministry of Labour very recently uh, um, published its interpretation of the new legislation and it states that the ban only applies for non-compete agreements that were entered into after October 25th, 2021. So if you have existing non-compete agreements that were enforced before October 25th, 2021, this legislation will not impact those non-compete agreements. Furthermore, the ministry is very clear that the ban on non-compete agreements does not extend to non-solicitation agreements or non-disclosure agreements. It's only non-competes where which feature the prohibition of working elsewhere in one's own uh, occupation or in the business of the company. There's also two very important exceptions, one being the sale of the business uh, exception. So where a business is being sold or a part of a business is being sold and as part of the purchase agreement the, uh, the seller or the lessor becomes an employee of the purchaser and there's a non-competition covenant as part of the transaction, uh, then the Employment Standards Act ban on non-competes will not apply to that, uh, to that scenario. And a, a sale of a business also includes a lease, which is important. 
The second exception is the executive exception. So if an employee is a president or a chief financial officer, uh, those individuals can, can uh, still be covered by a non-competition uh, covenant. Um, there's a list of the, uh, the executive positions that would be uh, covered by this exclusion, and it is not just any manager. It's really got, has to be someone in the C-suite who's the, the chief uh, of their respective uh, division or, or uh, part of the business. So we'll move on to the next screen, which is the disconnect from work policy. Uh, again, this is unique in Canada. Uh, no other province has uh, a dis this new uh, legislation with respect to uh, a disconnect policy. And it only applies for employers in Ontario who have 25 or more employees as of January 1st. Uh, and if that is satisfied, the employer needs to have a written policy in place uh, before March 1st of that year. For 2022, uh, there is a bit of a grace period and the uh, disconnect from work uh, policy needs to be in place by June the 2nd, 2022. The legislation defines a disconnecting from work and, and we put the definition in here, um, but it's very important to note that it doesn't ban uh, contacting your employees after work hours. It just states that there needs to be a policy in place surrounding uh, the ability of the, the worker to disconnect from work. Uh, we strongly recommend that any overtime policies stay in place. This uh, disconnect, right to disconnect policy would work hand in hand and should work hand in hand with an overtime policy, um, but, but certainly keep your, your eye still on, on employees working overtime. Uh, finally, uh, the policy needs to be provided to existing um, employees 30 days after the uh, preparation of the policy and for new hires, it needs to be pr provided to them within 30 days as well. I, the uh, legislation makes note that the, uh, the policy may need to have prescribed information, but as of today, the, the government has not provided any detail or regulations for that matter on what are pre prescribed elements of the policy. Uh, so with that in mind, you'll be hearing more from, uh, from us at Dentons with respect to uh, a template policy that you may want to consider a, in the future. And certainly before uh, June the 2nd, 2022, if you've got a, a workforce of over 25 employees in Ontario uh, and, and what that template would, will look like. And so you'll be hearing more from us in, in 2022 about that. The next uh, slide deals with some extensions. So there's been the extension um, of the Worker Income Protection Benefit Program. This effectively is paid uh, sick leave, uh, but only related to COVID-19 reasons. And it is uh, limited to three days, and it's for up to $200 per day uh, for an employee. There is the ability for eligible employers, and eligible employers are, are, uh, are specifically uh, listed in the legislation and the regulations with respect to who, who can uh, get reimbursement from the workers, uh, Workplace Safety and Insurance Board with respect to this $200 per employee per day taken. Uh, but it, there is a, a mechanism in place to uh, be reimbursed for the uh, WIPB. Um, lastly, employers will need to provide eligible employees that have not exhausted their entitlements with three pays, paid days of IDEL if they meet prescribed conditions. So that's been extended to July 31st, 2022. And the other extension uh, is to the deemed infectious disease emergency leave. This uh, IDEL has been in place since uh, the pandemic began in 2020 and it keeps on getting extended. And it's job protected leave for non-unionized employees whose uh, hours of work are reduced or eliminated as a result of the pandemic. Um, it's effectively uh, placing people who were on a temporary layoff in the non-unionized uh, place uh, and putting them on this deemed statutory uh, job protected leave of absence. It also states uh, clearly that 
someone, an employee who's on IDEL has not been constructively dismissed under the statute. That's very important. It means that the employee is not eligible for statutory termination pay or statutory severance pay. Um, but there is a live question in the Ontario courts as to whether being on IDEL means that the employee has been constructively um, dismissed under the common law. But under the legislation, an employee who is on IDEL cannot uh, receive termination or severance pay uh, entitlements. It also uh, temporarily delays the uh, time period for a temporary layoff. So if one is on IDEL, it doesn't uh, operate at the same time as the layoff. That will mean that as of July 30th, 2022, if the IDEL does not get extended and the employee is still on, on leave, um, it will mean that the layoff uh, start date will begin as of July 30th, 2022. But I would caution employers to stay tuned in the days leading up to July 30th, 2022, and to see whether the government once again extends the IDEL as it has throughout uh, 2021 and 2020. So with that, it uh, concludes the, my presentation on the legislative updates. And now that I'll pass it on to my colleague, Eleni Casares about uh, the BC paid sick leave. Yes, hello everyone. Um, BC now has five paid days of sick leave for all eligible employees. Um, it's a big change in the province and it's going to be a big change for employers to manage the issue of how they calculate sick, day, sick days, um, how they you know, marry the sick days with their other sick policies and their other leave policies. And I'm gonna to try to cover the basics for you today. So everyone who is eligible under employment standards, um, so not exempt employees, and of course, very few employees in BC are exempt from employment standards, usually um, professional occupations such as lawyers, doctors, engineers, et cetera. Um, so everybody else, it doesn't matter if you're full-time, part-time, or casual, will be eligible for this paid leave. Um, the days are structured under the Act to be paid in one day increments. And we'll get into some examples of how even if that person calls in sick for a day they were scheduled to work half a day, they would get a full day's pay, basically. Um, the employer can request that reasonably sufficient proof um, that the employee is entitled to the leave. And we'll talk about what reasonably sufficient proof may look like. The leave does not carry over if not used. So when the employment year ticks over, there's a new five days and the old five days are gone if they haven't been used. This is a job protected leave, just like every other leave under the Employment Standards Act. So that means that you cannot discipline someone or terminate them or change a condition of employment during the leave or as a result of the leave without the consent of the employee. This legislation came into force as of Jan 1 and it replaced the previous three days of paid leave that employees in British Columbia were entitled to take for COVID related reasons, but it does not replace the other leaves in our statute relating to absence from work for COVID related reasons. So there's a series of unpaid leave provisions in the Employment Standards Act, where if you're taking care of a relative or um, need time off to, uh, deal with COVID related issues, you can have unpaid time off for those reasons. Um, it also does not replace and it continues to be a requirement in BC that you give employees three hours of paid time off um, to, for vaccination leave. So that's kind of the lay of the land. If we can go to the next slide. So what is the employment year? So unfortunately, and this will cause a lot of anger <laughs> within um, groups of people within employers that are trying to organize this and process this and manage this. Unlike vacation that permits, unlike vacation provisions under the act, which permit a common date for all of your employees if you set it up that way, 
um, sick leave, it hasn't been set up that way in the act. Instead, you have each employee has their five days allotted to them based on their employment year, not the calendar year. So that is measured from the start of employment, even though employees can't take the sick leave until they've been working at least 90 days. So the practical impact of that is that in theory, in some calendar years, your employees could take up to 10 paid sick days. So I have an example here and you know, all of my examples are taken from the employment standards. They've been modified to some degree, but they are taken from the employment standards um, interpretation guidelines that are published on this matter. So as crazy as they look, this is what we know about um, BC sick leave uh, at this time. So for example, if your employee was hired on April 1, 2021, um, they've worked more than 90 days as of Jan 1. So they get from Jan 1 to March 31st, 2022, in theory, they could take five paid sick days. And then as of April 1, 2022, they could take additional five paid sick days up until um, their anniversary date, basically, which means that if they take um, five days before, their anniversary date, they could take five more days before the end of this year, and they will have taken 10 calendar days of sick leave in the year. Now, presumably, um, you know, they're supporting their sick leave and it's all fine, but I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of misinformation out there. The Employment Standards website on their fact sheets talks about in a year, when the legislation talks about the employment year. So it is a very important distinction. And I think a lot of employers are, are primed to um, possibly make mistakes in this regard because of, of how the published information has been presented. So if we can go to the next slide. So how is this paid sick day calculated? Um, it's calculated in a manner that we've seen before in the BC Employment Standards Act with respect to calculating statutory holiday pay. So it's basic, based on a formula of amount paid divided by day's work in order to create a calculation of what an average day's pay is. So amount paid is the amount paid or payable to the employee for work that is done during and wages that are earned within the 30 calendar day period preceding the leave, including vacation pay that is paid or payable for any days of vacation taken within that period, less any amounts paid or payable for overtime. And days worked is the number of days the employee worked or earned wages within that 30 calendar day period. So if we go to the next slide, I will give you an example. Um, so this example, the salesperson has worked 18 out of the last 30 days before January 28th, eight hours per day, Monday to Friday. The employee earned 6,000 per month. And in the last 30 days, the employee earned not only their salary, but also $10,000 in commission. So to calculate an average day's pay under the act, you have to go through this process, which is first you calculate the regular wage. And I won't bore everyone with the specifics, but you get to um, a regular hourly wage, and then you multiply it by the hours in a day and the number of days worked in the 30 day period. So in this example, that works out to $4,985.62. And I put the per day um, amount there of 276.96 um, because I think People will be interested to see how it really is affected by adding in other wages like commissions. So once you get your, you know, how much is earned in the 18 days, then you have to add in the commissions. As you'll see there, I've added in the $10,000. And then you divide that total of $14,928 by 18 and you get the average day's pay. So this employee for their sick day even though their salary is only 276.96 for the period in one day, they would be receiving $832.48 for their sick day. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So before I talk about reasonable proof, I did see in the chat, there's a question about um, casual employees. And this will be something that, um, is going to cause a lot of uh, 
possibly just rage and anger among employers when they might have to pay casual workers a full day's pay when they have worked very little in the month. So just to give you an example straight from the employment standards guidelines, you have an example that says a casual worker has been employed for many years, is scheduled to work two days in March. They don't earn any wages um, outside of March because they didn't work called in in January or February. On March 1st, they work one eight-hour shift. They call in sick for their three-hour shift on March 2nd, but they're entitled to eight hours of pay based on the average day's pay formula according to the Employment Standards Branch. So it is going to be a little bit tricky navigating these things um, until you get used to the fact that an average day's pay may not equate directly to the scheduled work that was lost by the employee calling in sick. So what is reasonable proof? If requested, the employee must as soon as practical, practical and it's recognize that you know you might have an emergency where you go to the hospital and you can't necessarily provide a doctor's note um, in advance or schedule your sick leave so it's as soon as practicable and what is reasonable sufficient proof you can take whatever you want as an employer and the branch is recommending that employers just act reasonably it might be for example you accept a receipt from a drugstore or pharmacy if someone says you know, I came down with the flu, here's my antibiotics prescription proof. Um, mostly it's going to be a doctor's note and that's fine. Um, there's recommendations that you don't be unduly restrictive. So for example, if someone um, were to call in with a migraine, um, oh, I have a migraine today, I can't come in, just give me a sick day. Um, you might trust that employee and say, okay, that's fine and not necessarily recommend them require them to provide a doctor's note. Um, so verbal proof, credible verbal information is acceptable under, under the act and is encouraged. Um, they do give the example of, you know, it may be that someone's developing a pattern of, you know, suspicious behavior, like I'm always sick on a Friday or a Monday <laughs> to create extra long weekends. And there the employment standards branch recognizes that you might require an elevated form of proof, like a more specific doctor's note to substantiate the sick time. So if we can go to the next slide. So what about statutory holidays? Um, this is something that is also going to seem odd to many. Um, they're separate entitlements. So under the statutory holiday provisions, you are entitled to an average day's pay um, when on the statutory holiday. So if you're not working on the statutory holiday, you're entitled to an average day's pay. If you are working on the statutory holiday, you are entitled to an average day's pay plus, you know, usually time and a half for the hours actually worked. But if you're scheduled to work on a statutory holiday <laughs> and you call in sick, um, then you would be entitled not only to the average day's pay for the statutory holiday, but also to an average day's pay as a sick day. So that is the lay of the land in BC. And then on the next slide, I'll go through just you know, a recap of some frequently asked questions that we're getting. Um, so as I mentioned, you are not able to create a common date for sick day accruals the way that you can for vacation pay. Um, can you provide the sick time and you know, half day increments? Um, this employment standards branch says no. There's no provisions in the legislation for prorating or subdividing the entitlement. And you know, as I said with the casual worker example, in some cases you may owe someone who calls in sick when they're only scheduled to work half a day, you might owe them a full day's pay, um, depending on how the calculation of average day's pay works for that 30 day period. Um, you know, another question I'm getting is, oh, our policy, we already give, you know, 10 paid sick days a year. Um, is that Fine. And I say, you know, it may be fine. Um, we have to look at your policy and make sure that it's compliant with what employment standards accepts, because a lot of policies often will accrue sick time or allow people to subdivide the entitlement and cover in either hours or half days for taking that type of paid time off. 
and it may not jive perfectly with employment standards. And as a result, it's not just saying to your employees, um, well, our policy already encompasses five days, so you know the policy applies. You have to actually look at your policy and consider modifying it or editing it to make sure that it's complying and aligning with what employment standards expects. Otherwise, you will be um, likely find yourself in breach of the legislation. And then the last question I'm getting is, I already have a collective agreement that gives six days to bargaining unit members. Is that good enough? Maybe. So similar with um, reviewing your sick leave policy for compliance with the legislation, uh, if, it, if you're non-union, if you're union, the collective agreement will only replace the legislation if on consideration of the terms of the collective agreement, you know, they meet or exceed the requirements of the ESA. So for example, if you have a sick leave policy that um, you know, only full-time employees are entitled to sick leave and that is baked into the collective agreement, that's not going to be meeting or exceeding the requirements of the ESA, which means because it doesn't cover casual workers or part-time workers. So the ESA provisions will be incorporated by reference into the collective agreement. So there is going to be some work in negotiating revisions to collective agreements and to policies and revising your non-union policies in order to align with BC sick leave. So with that, I will turn it over to Larissa, who will tell you about federal paid sick leave. Thank you very much, Eleni. Um, and so we've all learned now about the changing sick leave landscape in British Columbia, and I'm gonna shift gears and talk about another changing sick leave landscape, that being the one for federally regulated employers. But before I lose all of the non-federally regulated employers that are listening right now, do stay tuned for the end of my presentation uh, because I am gonna be talking a bit about a sick leave trend to watch out for in 2022 that might have an impact on, on your workplaces. Now, on November 26, 2021, the Government of Canada introduced Bill C-3, which proposed amendments to the Canada Labour Code. And the intention behind this bill was to address issues that, according to the government, had been highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic, in particular, the fact that a number of Canadian workers across the country had limited access to paid statutory sick days. So through Bill C-3, the intention was to provide some paid sick time to workers in the federally regulated private sector. And so what changes were introduced? Well, if you, as you can see from the slide, before I get into what changes were introduced, I think it's helpful to start with an overview of what the current sick leave landscape is under the Canada Labour Code, both paid and unpaid, because the changes tie in to this current landscape. And I'm certain that most, if not all, of the federally regulated employers that are listening right now are familiar with the personal leave days under the code, which provide employees with up to five days of personal leave three of which, the first three of which are paid uh, if the employee has been employed for three or, uh, months or longer. And these personal days can be used for any of the reasons that are currently prescribed under the code. And you can see, as I've bolded and underlined, that one of the reasons that employees can use uh, these personal leave days for is if they have to take time off to treat an illness or injury. So this is effectively the closest the Canada Labour Code has at the moment to paid sick days under the code. And so that's one part of the sick leave landscape under the code. And if we turn to the next slide, the other part is that the code provides employees with up to 17 weeks of unpaid medical leave if the employee needs time off for personal illness or injury, organ or tissue donation, or to attend medical appointments during their working hours. The code also provides uh, up to 16 weeks of protected leave if an individual has to quarantine, but that part of the medical leave provisions is not relevant for the purposes of the rest of what I'm going to be discussing with everyone today. And why do these two schemes matter? The personal leave days on the one hand and the medical leave entitlements on the other hand. And the answer to that is that the new paid sick leave that's being introduced through Bill C-3 
is essentially an expansion of the personal leave days, but that expansion is now being relocated under the medical leave provisions of the Canada Labor Code. So let me explain what I mean by that. And if we turn to the next slide, the first change that is being introduced through Bill C-3 is that treating illness or injury, the reason that you know two slides ago you would have seen I had bolded and underlined, is no longer going to be a reason for which the personal leave days under the code can be taken. And the personal leave days are otherwise unchanged. They remain available to employees. And you know, the other reasons that have been prescribed are untouched. But effectively, the paid sick days uh, are no longer being governed by the personal leave day rules under the code. And instead, to replace these previous entitlements, the three paid sick days are being expanded by B Bill C-3 and moved over to the current medical leave entitlements. So that now, under the medical leave provisions, employees will earn up to 10 paid days of medical leave. And originally when Bill C-3 was introduced, it simply contemplated a process through which employees would be earning one paid day a month at the beginning of the month, up to a maximum of 10 days per calendar year. However, this received a lot of criticism from senators who said that it didn't really, it was, it was inconsistent with the stated intention of the legislation, which is the fact that it was, it was trying to address a problem that had been identified through the COVID-19 pandemic and ideally respond to that problem while the pandemic was still at its height. Um, and, and so uh, in response to this feedback, the bill was revised. And th what you see on the slide is the final version of the bill uh, that did come into effect, uh, or rather that, that uh, received royal assent. And you have sort of three different timelines in terms of when these leave days are going to be earned. So first, starting with employees that are currently employed by their employer at the time that the bill uh, provisions come into effect, they will earn the first three of the paid leave days within the first 30 days after the bill comes into force. So after 30 days have, have passed. And then after 60 days of continuous employment with their employer following the coming into effect of these provisions, then that one month or one paid day per month calculation is going to kick in for the remainder of the calendar year in which the provisions come into effect. And this a similar scheme is what's being introduced for any employees that are hired by the employer in the calendar year in which these changes do come into effect, which presumably is going to be 2022, with the first three paid medical leave days being earned 30 days after the employee starts work for their employer. And then after 60 days of continuous employment, that one day per month calculation is going to kick in. And then after the initial transition year of, this, uh, of these changes is over, the paid medical leave days are going to be earned at the original rate that was contemplated, being a rate of one day per month earned at the beginning of the month, up to a maximum of 10 days per calendar year. If we turn to the next slide, a couple of other aspects of this paid medical leave entitlement that I wanted to note because they're important is, first, the unused paid leave days that are being, that, that exist or remain at the end of a calendar year, they will carry forward to the next year, uh, to, to January 1st of that following year. And these, carried over days are going to count towards the 10 days that an employee would be able to earn in that next calendar year. So what this means practically is that employees can only take a maximum of 10 paid days of medical leave per calendar year, regardless of how many days they may or may not have taken in the previous year. What this also means practically is that employees are going to be much more likely to use up the calendar days that they have earned in the calendar year because they know that those days are not going to carry forward and if anything would impact their uh, potential entitlement under the next year. The second thing to note is that the paid days are compensated at the employee's regular rate of wages for their normal hours of work, 
which is the same language uh, that we see for a, a number of other paid entitlements under the Canada Labour Code. Uh, and I expect we will see some amendments to regulations relating to exactly how that formula is going to play out. And lastly, employers can ask for a medical certificate, but they can only do so if the employee's paid medical leave is five consecutive days or longer. And this is another change that was introduced after consultation. Originally, Bill C-3 provided that a medical certificate could be requested if an employee was asking to use their paid medical leave, which would mean that the employer could be requesting it for each day and each, each instance that the employee was asking to take that paid medical leave. But unfortunately, after consultation, that changed and, and it was viewed as too harsh of a requirement and the legislation was ultimately amended to include this five-day threshold. One final thing to note about Bill C-3 is that one, an additional change to the Canada Labour Code was made that is unrelated to the new paid medical leave scheme, and that's a change related to bereavement leave. Specifically, bereavement leave uh, has been expanded so that if an employee loses a child or experiences a stillbirth, they will receive up to eight weeks of bereavement leave. And since a lot of focus is being put on the paid medical leave part uh, and introduction, I wanted to make sure that this was something that was also flagged to everyone that's listening. So when did these changes come into effect? Well, if we turn to the next slide, as I've already noted, Bill C-3 has received Royal Assent. It received Royal Assent on December 17th, 2021. So very shortly after the bill was originally introduced. However, the sections related to both the paid medical leave changes as well as the bereavement leave expansion do not come into, into force until an order in council is issued. And you know, as of you know, the last time I checked earlier today, uh, no orders in council have yet been issued. So it's, it's unclear when exactly these changes are going to come into effect, but this is definitely something to keep an eye on in 2022. And, and we will, of course, uh, update everyone who is subscribed to our various blogs and, and other resources uh, when this change comes into effect. I, I would expect it's going to be relatively quickly given the stated intention of the legislative changes uh, and the fact that many provinces in Canada continue to respond and experience some difficulties with the Omicron variant. And speaking of provinces, I did tease a trend for 2022 that provincially regulated employers should be aware of. And that is in all of the discussions around the introduction of this paid uh, medical leave at the federal level, uh, when Bill, Bill C-3 was being introduced, the federal government did make clear in multiple releases and backgrounders on the change that it is also their intention to convene with the provinces and territories in early 2022 so that they can develop what they're referring to as a national action plan for legislated paid sick leave for all workers across Canada. And now the federal government has made clear that they're gonna be respecting provincial territorial jurisdiction. So the changes that we would see coming out of this national action plan are not gonna be legislated at the federal level, but depending on how these consultations go, it is possible, if not likely, that you know, British Columbia is not gonna be the only province that has had recent changes to paid sick leave. And we're gonna see more provinces introduce some form of a paid sick leave entitlement in the months to come, particularly if this seemingly never ending uh, pandemic does continue on. And with that, I'm now going to turn things over to my colleague, Andy, and he's gonna tell you about some other labor and employment trends that you should be keeping an eye out for in 2022. So thanks, Larissa, and thanks to everybody else who's already spoken, Matt and Eleni. It's been a very healthy chat. Uh, we've already answered, I think, 20 questions in the chat. There are still some outstanding. We'll do our best to kind of hit the highlights uh, at the end of this presentation. So you've heard about the legislative changes. I'm going to speak to you about some other trends that uh, we think are worth watching and, and are likely going to impact your business. So first of all, like Larissa just mentioned, this never-ending pandemic. COVID-19 compliance matters are going to continue for sure for 2022. And as you likely are, are reading in the news and probably experiencing in your own workplaces, mandatory vaccination issue continues to be something that is impacting businesses of all sectors in all industries. And 
every company is grappling with how they are dealing with mandatory vaccinations and whether they're doing a testing regime, whether they are requiring vaccinations for access. And the case law continues to evolve. Uh, I've cited two more recent cases. For those of you who are on our client alert list, you will have received either our COVID-19 case catalog at the end of the year, which summarized all of the relevant COVID cases that we thought were noteworthy. As well, we've also issued a uh, mandatory vaccine case law update and expect that we'll be issuing another one of those soon. Um, what's happened, again, it's all happening in the labor setting right now because those cases, generally speaking, will proceed faster to a decision-making process than the civil system, which will require, uh, uh, and which will take generally a much longer period of time before you actually get a judge to hear the case and actually make the decision. Bloomfield and Service Employees International Union, this was a case at the Ontario Labor Relations Board, a bit of a different um, take on it. The employee was upset that the union had not grieved the employer's vaccination policy and so had brought a duty of fair representation complaint. The, the board though said there was nothing that the union had done that would warrant uh, granting that complaint, so it was dismissed. Uh, Teamsters Local Union 847 versus uh, MLSE, a very recent case. And again, not looking necessarily just at whether or not the policy was enforceable. In this case, it was an employee who was grieving the employer's action in putting the employee on an unpaid leave after the employee failed to disclose his vaccination status. And the arbitrator had some very, very helpful things to say about the need for these policies why vaccines were important. So a very, very good decision for employers and dismissed the employee's grievance. So you're gonna see a lot of things in the news about these types of cases. It's important that when you're reading anything in the media, that there's a distinction between union employees and non-union employees and how union employees are dealt with at termination versus how uh, non-union employees. Union employees cannot be dismissed without cause. And so when you read about employees being terminated, those are cause terminations. In the non-union setting, as you know, employers can terminate employees without cause. So uh, when you read that a company may have dismissed a whole bunch of employees, uh, it'll be important for you to consider, well, was it a union or a non-union employee? Was it with or without cause? And that's going to be the real question is whether or not mandatory vaccine, uh, breaches of mandatory vaccine policies would constitute cause termination. and, and uh, I, I think that there remains a very good argument for employers on that basis. It's, it'll always depend on the facts, but certainly the nature of the workplace, the ab ability of, of employees, if they're working close to one another, um, a vaccine uh, policy and a breach of that vaccine policy may indeed warrant cause. Matt uh, Curtis referenced the IDEL and the constructive dismissal issue. We have conflicting case law in Ontario, and that case, those cases are scheduled to be heard by the Ontario Court of Appeal in April, I believe. So expect to see some sort of development there, and it may not be the last word. There may be uh, a move for the losing party to appeal to the Supreme Court. We'll see, but that it will at least provide some level of guidance. The last thing I've noticed is the tool you need for 2022 is COVID-19 compliance matters are definitely going to be continuing this year, but as you will have seen yesterday, the United Kingdom announced they're repealing all of their uh, lockdown measures, restrictions on masks, et cetera. And so the reason why I've highlighted this little chart is we have been preparing a chart that we distribute to clients who have asked for it um, that covers all of the lockdown measures across the country. And I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, I'm sure everyone else is, is that hopefully we are going to start to see a lessening of these restrictions so long as public health guidance encourages it. So I think it's important if you would like us to add you to the uh, distribution list or the mailing list, then please email us. Uh, you can email me, you can email the Denton's lawyer that you regularly deal with and just say, I'd like to be added to that status, that chart of status of lockdown measures, because I expect that this is going to become a very fluid situation. Uh, when we start exiting some of these lockdown measures. I don't, I don't have any, um, any idea as to when masking mandates will be, uh, will be lifted. I expect that's going to continue for some time, but I think it'll be important in terms of what employers need to be changing in terms of their own COVID protocols as we move through the pandemic. So if we look to the next uh, trend, 
Um, again, this has a uh, COVID-19 tinge to it is there's been so much talked about return to office and it's been, you know, starts and stops in terms of getting employees back to the physical office. What we're now seeing is we're, you know, we've kind of gone from ever getting people back to the office, navigating a hybrid working environment to a lot of employers are just saying you can work from anywhere. And when we say anywhere, it's not just work from home or if you have a vacation property, you can work from that vacation property. Now, some companies are considering that if you want to go and work in another country for a certain period of time, that's totally fine with us. You just need to let us know. And, there, and employers are starting to navigate how those policies work. This is a really important um, topic because if you're trying to differentiate yourself in the market, that's fine. But these types of arrangements are going to trigger immigration laws, employment laws, privacy laws, and most importantly, tax. The biggest concern that an employer needs to be aware of is would allowing an employee, if you're a resident Canadian employee and you've decided that you want to go and spend six is that going to trigger any issues in terms of establishing, uh, creating a permanent establishment which has tax implications for your company? You would not want to inadvertently try and be so flexible that you somehow change your tax burden or your tax obligations. So uh, that is something that if you're considering that, please do uh, let us know and we will um, be happy to help. And we're actually really well situated for that because as you know, we're the largest law firm in the world. We have offices in virtually every country. And so it allows us to work with our colleagues to tell you exactly what the tax implications are when you're considering this type of a program. Moving away a bit from the pandemic and when we talk about the next trend, more of a wrongful dismissal litigation is mitigation. And you will all know that the basic principle in wrongful dismissal law or litigation is that a dismissed employee has a duty to take reasonable steps to obtain equivalent employment elsewhere and to accept such employment if it's available. Now there's some nuances, of course, if there's a contractual termination provision which doesn't provide for any reduction from mitigation, then it doesn't matter if the employee mitigates or not. But generally speaking, it's not such a clause, then what you're looking is that you need to include, uh, you need to look from, uh, sorry, you need to make sure that you are looking for uh, what the employee can do in, and the onus is on the employer to make sure that you're taking, re that they're taking reasonable steps to make it that if the employee could have found a uh, new job or had a, had a look, they would have found a new job. And so why this is important now is if you look at where the unemployment rate is in Canada, it has dropped substantially from January of 2021. And anecdotally, what we see in the media is that there is a, a significant labor shortage. So what that means is that there is a good likelihood that if the employee is looking for a job, they're going to find it. And that 12 month notice period could shrink to the differential between whatever the income is uh, over the stub period of the notice period if the employee gets a new job quickly. So again, uh, really keep, in, keep that in mind. Uh, and sorry for the jumping around on the, the slides. Uh, really keep that in mind as you consider what you can do when you're hit with a wrongful dismissal claim. And so if we look finally at the last trend, this is something that I think was underreported in Canada last year. Uh, at the end of the year, Prince Edward Island passed a law about non-disclosure agreements. And what they said is that in the context of non-disclosure agreements from, uh, <clears throat> in, in the context of harassment and sexual harassment complaints, they would not be permitted unless such an agreement was the expressed wish and preference of the relevant person concerned. Even then, even when there was a, a non-disclosure agreement, that there are some really uh, important limitations on what that allows. So the relevant person has to be offered in writing independent legal advice. There can be no undue attempts to influence the person to enter into that non-disclosure agreement. It can affect the health and safety of, of a third party or public interest. And then this is really important. The agreement has to be of a set and limited duration, and it also has to allow an opportunity for the relevant person, so the complainant, the person who's been the alleged victim of the harassment, to decide if 
to waive their own confidentiality in the future. So even if you have this non-disclosure agreement, it might not be forever. Now, the PEI government did include one limitation, which was that the new law would not prohibit any sort of non-disclosure obligation over the amount of any settlement payment if that was offered. So even though you're really just looking at the non-disclosure over the facts of the situation, not necessarily the money. So this is from Prince Edward Island. As someone noted in the, in the chat, talking about federally regulated employers, there's a lot of copycat legislation that happens across Canada. And so what that means is that, you know, just because this has started in Prince Edward Island doesn't mean it couldn't be coming to a province near you. And we already know that, that Manitoba is considering it. There's been some rumblings that BC is, is at least looking at it. And there was an article recently, uh, as recent as this week, that said the Ontario government is aware of it, but not taking any steps just yet. So something to really watch, because that would be a pretty significant change in how employers approach some of these, uh, some of these issues. And uh, again, uh, it's, it could be uh, something that gains traction, especially in an election year in certain provinces. So that's the trends that we had, we had followed. I'll let all of my uh, colleagues come back on, maybe look to see if we can um, pass a few more, uh, or answer a few more questions. Um, one thing that has come up, and Matt, I know you answered it in the chat and you also kind of referenced it a bit in your own presentation. There are questions about what should we be doing if we have a non-compete agreement that's already in an employment contract? Yeah, no, it's a, uh, a lot of interest on that, that point. And the Ministry of Labor's position right now is that if that employment agreement or any other uh, non-compete agreement was entered into before October 25th, 2021, the ban does not apply uh, to that agreement. It's only agreements entered into after October 25th, 2021, that the ministry will look at. That doesn't mean that the non-compete is enforceable and binding in, in court, in the civil court. It's just whether it's violating the Ontario Employment Standards Act that the Ministry of Labour uh, will, will review the non-compete and the date the non-compete was entered into. Thanks. And, and uh, Eleni, question for you, and, and it really gets back to what you were saying about what is reasonable proof? And, and if maybe you could just go over again, if you have the people who are either not providing the proof or you think that they're just kind of habitually missing every Monday, how would you practically deal with that under the new law? Yeah, I mean, employers have been struggling with the issue of um, employees taking off sick or not showing up for work or being late or absent for way before BC ever en enacted um, paid sick leave. So it it's going to be a similar process. You're allowed as an employer to say, you know, your pattern is concerning us. We expect you to provide a doctor's note to substantiate this leave or you know, say they say, I really needed a mental health day. Okay, well, you're going to have to give us a mental health practitioner's note that you needed to be off on that day in order to access the paid sick day. Um, unfortunately, you're often escalating into a place of distrust if you're getting to the point where you don't believe that your employees were actually sick, um, but you can require proof. The interpretation guidelines are quite silly in saying, you know, show me like a prescription receipt. Well, what, the, what does that tell an employer about we needed the time off? But I think that if you approach it similar to how you approached it in the past with employees that are calling in sick without, you know, validating that, um, you can ask them to validate that just like you used to do in the past. Um, I, there was a question on the chat, which I did answer um, about, well, can we withhold the sick pay while we're getting the information? And the legislation doesn't really provide for that. So if you were to do that, um, you would likely be offside other provisions in the act, which require you to pay wages at regular intervals. Uh, so if the wage is arguably earned, and then do as part of payroll, you, you do need to pay it out and, and deal with the ramifications of that later if you find out that the sick leave was, you know, dishonest. 
Great, thanks, Eleni. And Matt, I'll give you the last word because the uh, disconnect from work policy seems to be something that employers are particularly concerned. And again, um, we will be having a template policy. We'll be offering that to clients for a fixed fee of $1,000. So if you're interested in that, just again, reach out to the Denton's lawyer that you regularly work with. And that's still, we're still waiting for some guidance from the, from the government on regulations, but, it, but we will have that ready. Uh, but most importantly, Matt, there's some concern in the chat about how this policy is going to work with on-call workers or, or managers. Do you, do you have any insight on that, recognizing that we don't have everything in front of us from a regulatory uh, perspective? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's a, and it's a very big concern as well, uh, because the legislation does not exempt uh, those employees from being subject to the policy on disconnect from work. But it also says that, it doesn't say that they can't be reached uh, outside of work hours either. So uh, there's no ban on contacting managers or on-call staff outside of uh, work normal work hours, but the policy that would need to be in place would effectively put down the employer's expectations going forward and also any uh, required regulatory elements, which, as you just pointed out, have, have not been uh, published as of today's date. So I think it's uh, worthy to stay tuned closer to June 2nd and also to keep an eye out for our template that we hope to publish in the near future. Great. Well, thanks so much to our panelists, uh, David and Justine, who are our technical uh, support and making sure that everything runs as smoothly as possible uh, in this virtual. Uh, and most importantly, thanks to all of you. Thanks to everyone who has tuned in. Uh, it was a record setting amount of questions and we have a lot of them. So we'll hopefully try and get to some more of them on our next webinar, which is Friday, February 25th. We'll be uh, considering topics. We always like to make sure they're timely. If ever you have a suggestion, feel free to let us know whether you just do it in the feedback that comes with the post email, uh, post event email, because we want to make sure that we are providing information to you that's timely and that's relevant to your business. So thanks again to everyone. Let's hope that 2022 can only get better and have a really great weekend and stay safe and stay healthy. Bye-bye.